We tend to think of the Thai forest tradition as something very Thai. But that's because over the course of many decades it was able to redefine what Thai Buddhism was, what Thai culture was. When Ajahn Mun and Ajahn Sao were starting out, they met with a lot of resistance. In John Munn's words, he was determined to follow the customs of the Noble Ones, which, as he said, were very different from the customs of Thai people or Laotian people or any other culture. Because your regular culture is a culture of people in defilements, shaped by greed, aversion, and delusion. Whereas he wanted out of that culture, and the way out was to follow the customs of the Noble Ones. The John Cha has a very interesting discussion where he talks about how controversial both the John Sao and the John Mun were for many years. People used to get in arguments, even families would split over whether they thought the John Mun was right or not. And you have to wonder what kept him going. What was his determination? One, to find the true path to the end of suffering. And then his way of strengthening that determination. And there is in the face of a lot of resistance and a lot of controversy. Here we are practicing in another culture of people with defilements. And so we have to take John Munn's example as encouragement and as and as an example, as something to follow. starting with the determination that we don't want other people to determine what our path will be. After all, you look at the forest tradition in terms of what people might say from the outside, and the sons of peasants up in the northeast, which was the poorest part of the country, there wasn't much hope for them when you look from outside. And the society certainly hadn't assigned them a particularly good role. But John Mun didn't let that deter him, and his example then inspired many other people from the same place in a similar situation. So here we are living in a land of wrong view. We don't want that to determine our practice, or how far we can go in our practice, or what we should be doing in our practice. We want to take the example of the Noble Ones as our guide. But simply having the example is not enough. We have to be able to strengthen ourselves from within. Of course, the Buddhist teaching on strength are, are very important here. The five strengths, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. You notice that the three middle strengths there are basically identical with the section of the Noble Path that deals with meditation practice. So the meditation, of course, will be our real strength. In addition, you've got conviction and discernment. Conviction here means that your actions really are important. And John Lee, when he was giving a, a Dharma talk to one of his students who was on her deathbed, and he was reminding her that strength of the body and strength of the mind keep us going, but ultimately you have to depend on strength of the mind. He talked about conviction. He said it really comes down to the precepts. If you really are convinced in the principle of karma, you wouldn't break any of the precepts, particularly the big five ones. And as you realize that what you do, the decisions you make, and what's okay and what's not okay, will have a huge impact on the course of your meditation and the state of your mind. You want to be very careful about all the precepts you've taken on. You want to be very meticulous. This is your protection. You're protecting yourself from your own defilements. You're protecting other people from your defilements. And as you apply the precepts in all situations, as the Buddha said, you're giving universal safety to all beings. Good beings, bad beings, beings in between, people you like, people you don't like. You can't be picky about who's going to benefit from you at the fact that you're observing the precepts. And at the same time, you want to make sure you don't try to influence anyone else to break the precepts. 
that's your responsibility. Sometimes people say that there are dilemmas where one precept comes into conflict with another, but I can't think of any where you would have to lie in order not to kill, or kill in order not to lie. The Buddha set them out so they wouldn't be in conflict. Now our desires about what we want to protect and what we don't want to protect in our lives may come into conflict with the precepts, but the Buddha said, look, you want to hold to these across the board. And you learn how to question your likes and dislikes if you take the precepts as your guide. And so as you hold to the principle that you really do believe that your actions make a difference and you want to act in ways that are skillful, the precepts are a good test for that and also good training in that. But the precepts on their own are not enough. You've got to train the mind. That's what the three middle strengths are about. Persistence means basically right effort. Anything unskillful, you want to avoid it, abandon it. Anything that's skillful, you want to give rise to it and develop it. The word want here is important. It's an, actually part of the definition. You generate desire. Not all desire is bad in the Buddhist path. The craving that leads to suffering is particularly three kinds, for sensuality, for becoming, non-becoming. But the desire to do well on the path is not part of the cause of suffering, it's part of the path. And so you try to nurture that desire and give rise to it. Again, one of the customs of the Noble Ones is that you delight in abandoning unskillful things and you delight in developing skillful qualities. So you want to learn how to take delight in this. I was mentioning the other day, one of my students who tends to put himself into difficult situations to strengthen himself and to have a good story to tell when he comes back. And you can see that he's taking a lot of delight in it. It's, it becomes something that's fun to do. It's a challenge that he's up for. So whatever you can do to encourage yourself in this challenge is all part of the path. Mindfulness is also a kind of protection, and that helps you remember the lessons you've learned and remember the lessons from the Buddha about what should and shouldn't be done, what should, what, <clears throat> what counts as skillful and what doesn't count as skillful. You want to always keep that in mind, that these are your main frame of reference. And again, not the values of the people around you necessarily, the values of our society or just the desire to please people. There's a tendency nowadays for people to think that Buddhism is all about adapting itself. Well, that comes from the fact that most of us have learned about Buddhism in school. It's one of the first places we learn about it. And in schools, what can they talk about? Can they talk about whether the Buddha really put an end to suffering or not? No. They don't know. All those professors at all their degrees, none of them can use any of their scholarly techniques to determine whether the Buddha could put an end to suffering or not. So they talk about other things. They talk about, well, this text says that, and that text says this, and this group of people say that, and they practice like this. And what do you have? There's no standard. Because the big question you want to bring to Buddhism is, does this really put an end to suffering? And they can't answer that question. So they talk about everything around it. And what around it, what's around it comes, well, this person changed Buddhism that way by that, by that text, and that person changed it with this practice. And all of a sudden Buddhism becomes something that people create and something that changes over time. And that's what Buddhism is all about, they say. But we can't hold by that. And John Mun, as our example, and John Lee and all the other Forrester Johns. For them, it was the customs of the noble ones. That was a standard across the board. You want to hold that standard in mind, which includes being content with your material objects. The more you're able to be content with what material objects you have, the less dependent you are on other people's opinions. That's a way of freeing yourself. So these are some of the things you want to keep in mind, in addition to your topic of meditation. Keep the values behind it in mind as well. 
concentration is also a strength. It's all very fine and good to have a lot of knowledge about what the Buddha taught, you know, about what the Ajahns taught, but what really carries you through is your ability to get the mind still in all kinds of situations. Then you might take that as a, as a challenge. Can you keep your mind still for long periods of time when you're alone? Can you keep your mind still when you're in noisy places, when you're with other people? Where do you find it difficult to keep your mind still? Well, try to work on your strengths so that you can find stillness even in the difficult places, difficult times. And as you work on that strength, as you exercise it, it becomes something you can more and more rely on. Your ultimate strength, of course, is discernment, wisdom, your ability to see where you're causing unnecessary stress and suffering and how you can relieve it. What you're doing, you can see yourself doing it and you can stop. That's basically what it comes down to. Because you see that the problem is not with people outside, it's with your own attitudes. We sometimes blame people outside for making us do this or say that, but why do they have that influence? Well, look inside. You're the one that let them have that influence. All of these qualities are undergirded by the quality the Buddha calls heedfulness. You realize that your actions really do make a difference, and if you're not careful, you can cause a lot of trouble. If you are careful, you can avoid that trouble. Suffering is not inevitable. We have that chant that we haven't gone beyond aging, illness, and death. Well, that's, an, that's a matter of the body. Those things will happen. The fact that we would suffer or not suffer over them, that's not predetermined. It depends on our choices. And it's at this point when you realize, say, aging comes, illness comes, death comes. Doctors can help you to some extent with that. Your friends can help you to some extent with that. But the question of whether you're going to suffer or not, that's something you've got to do for yourself. The more you're prepared the easier it's going to be. And there's no need to wait. So, well, saying, well, I'll deal with that defilement some other time. How, much, how many other times you're going to have? How much more time you're going to have? You don't really know. You do have this time right here, right now. And if you have the determination to make each moment of your practice count, the benefits are sure to come.